Hello, and welcome to the Outdoorsy Diva Podcast. I'm your host, Lauren, the Outdoorsy Diva. Thanks for joining adventures last episode we delved into the wonderful world of solo travel as a woman this episode as promised we're going to talk about how you can stay safe when you're traveling by yourself I have 10 life-saving safety tips that I think every woman needs to know for safe travel I say woman but these tips are absolutely good for anyone not just specific to women as I shared with you in the last episode I think that traveling by yourself is just a wonderful life-changing experience and something that I really encourage people to push their boundaries and to try at least once in their life. And of course, the number one reason why many people never even give it a try is because they're afraid. And I get it. There is unfortunately inherent evil in the world we live in um, and there's crazies everywhere. But to be fair, There's crazies right here where you live, in your own neighborhood, across the street from you, you know, so it's one of those things that you have to take a calculated risk and you prepare for what you can prepare for. And that's really the best you can do. So my first tip for traveling and staying safe when you're traveling by yourself is a really simple practical tip. Share the address or the location of where you're going with multiple people. So obviously these would be your next of kin, be it your spouse, uh, your besties, your parents, uh, your kids, but share it with at least a few people that you absolutely trust because you want people to know how to get a hold of you. You want people to know where you are. Now there's a really important tip about how you select who your people are going to be. They can't just be any old body. Obviously, they need to be dependable and they need to be trustworthy. But you also want people who are somewhat savvy when it comes to travel themselves. For instance, if something happened to you and you were out of the country and you designated someone to be your person, If for some reason they actually needed to physically get to you or come to the country that you're in, they need a passport. They need to be able to get on a plane in a short amount of time and come to your rescue. They should also have a credit card. I'm just saying this is not something that you want to task with your friend that you know is just not the most financially stable because when it comes down to it, They probably won't really be able to be all that much help. So just consider that. And your designated people, you should also make sure that when you fill out any kind of documentation, you designate them as emergency contacts. That way, when it comes to releasing information about you, if something happens, then they'll have less trouble doing so if they're not your spouse or your immediate next of kin. By you designating them as your emergency contact, you're letting people know that I've designated this person and they have permission to be contacted and to know what's going on with me. So for me, when I travel, my two besties always know where I am and so does my mom. I usually create a folder out on Google Drive. It's a shared folder and I can just drop uh, pictures and screenshots, you know, all the information about my travel plans for them. You can also use an app or a service like TripPro and that has the ability to save all of your travel plans for yourself and you can designate to also share that with certain people. My second tip, is to familiarize yourself with the surrounding area of your location. I always make it a point to use Google Maps and study the area within a few mile radius of where I'm going to be staying. And if I don't do it prior to my arrival, I definitely do it after I've gotten settled and before I venture out to explore. I also look for things like the nearest police station, pharmacies, hospitals, grocery stores, subway and train stations, just so I have a general idea of where these things are located. It's just something that I've learned over time of things that commonly come up. 
And I just feel a lot better and a lot more secure when I know that these things are within walking distance or within a decent Uber distance. And I won't feel panicked if something comes up and I need something. For instance, when I went on my very first international solo trip, my period came on unexpectedly, super early, and I was super pissed. I did not pack any supplies. I know, rookie mistake, but it was a whole two weeks early. Like I had no reason to think it would be that time. I felt like it had just gone off. So anyway, I had to do what I had to do, and that meant I had to find a store. I was in Portugal, and I was relying on my Google Translate to help me find what I needed to find. You know, thankfully many places use universal symbols that signify to you what things mean. And I was able to ask somebody where the nearest store was and I found a supermarket that was kind of similar to a Target actually inside of a shopping mall that wasn't far from my hotel. So crisis averted, but I felt way better knowing that there was a store just around the corner. My third tip is that I never walk around with a map out in the open. To me, this is just the quickest way to signal to the world and tell everybody, hey, look at me, I'm a tourist and I don't know where I'm going. Please rob me. I just don't do it. If it's an actual paper map and not your phone, which sometimes happens, right? You can get a map from a visitor center or they may give you one on arrival at your hotel. Your concierge might write helpful notes and tips for you on the map. And so you'll want to have it with you. And I totally get that. And there's nothing wrong with that. But there's a smart way to do it and not look like I'm the goober that doesn't belong. Please take all my money. Just don't do that. So what you can do if you need to look at your map, duck into like a store or a gift shop or a coffee shop or a restaurant or if there's an awning or somewhere a bit off the street that you can kind of get out of view from everyone where you can look at your map comfortably. Also somewhere where your back is not exposed for somebody to walk up on you behind you unexpectedly. It's pretty simple. And also when you are exploring, I don't recommend walking around with headphones. And if you're going to have on an earpiece, at least leave one out so you can hear and be aware of your surroundings. You just want to be inconspicuous about how you walk around. You want to blend in. You want to look like you belong. What I try to do is look at my phone, you know, at the map. I like to use City Mappers, a really good one that gives you great walking directions, especially and incorporates using public transportation. So I try to look at it and at least know my next couple of steps so that I can walk and not be constantly looking down at my phone because then I'm not alert and I'm not paying attention. If you at least know your next two to three moves, then you can just casually glance down at your phone as you need to check where you're going. My fourth tip is to know how to contact local authorities in the event of an emergency. Now, if you're traveling stateside, that's really a no brainer, right? you tell 911. But did you know that 911 is not universal throughout the world? In some places, they have their own codes to signify what an emergency number is. So there's a really good link that you can save. I'll have it in my show notes and it's on the State Department's website. So it's a really handy list of all the emergency numbers for many, many countries throughout the world. So this is one that I absolutely recommend that you go download, save it into your Google Drive or as a PDF in your phone um, that you can easily access. And I would recommend that you commit to memory for the country that you're going to be traveling to what their emergency code is. My fifth tip is to arm yourself. Yes, arm yourself. Don't be a sitting duck. That just makes no sense. As a woman traveling by yourself, you need some kind of mechanism to give yourself some kind of protection. Now, that could mean weapon 
or that could mean a deterrent and an alarm that's going to give you a chance to get away. So by weapon, I don't necessarily mean a firearm. Obviously, that comes with some complications when it comes to traveling. You definitely need to understand what the rules and the laws are of the destination that you're going to. Even if you're traveling from state to state, there are definitely differences in weapons laws from state to state and certainly in countries. There's very stringent laws on the way that you're able to travel and pack your firearm. So if you're about that life, research that, make sure you understand the laws and the rules of what you can and cannot do. But for those of us that aren't quite so ballsy, there are other practical options that you can take to arm yourself. For instance, I have a mace and that you are allowed to have in your checked luggage. You can have up to four ounces in size and it has to have the safety feature. This is something that I keep on my person when I'm walking around and not just for travel. This works for when I'm hiking or something like that in the woods, in the wild, by myself. I have my mace with me. You can also travel with a knife in your checked luggage. It has to be sheathed and it has to be within a certain size. If there's something you're unsure about that you want to take, you can always check the TSA website and it has a very extensive list of what you can and cannot take with you in your checked luggage. But trust me, you would really be amazed at the things you are allowed to have. Just make sure you do your due diligence on the laws of your destination so that you make sure you're in compliance with the way that you've chosen to protect yourself. I mean, nobody wants to end up in foreign jail. That's no bueno. If you don't have something like mace or some other kind of device to arm yourself, you know, like brass knuckles, I'm joking, kidding, joking. Okay, maybe not joking, but you can also opt for something like a panic device And that sounds an alarm. And the market is full of all kinds of panic devices out there. They are meant to signal for help and more importantly, to scare away your attacker because nobody wants something that's going to draw attention to them. So that's going to give you a chance to get away and hopefully draw attention to the situation so that they will leave you alone. You can also look for something as simple as a whistle. And I also highly recommend that you look into a door jammer. This is something that you can take with you in your checked luggage and where you're staying, it will fit on your door and it keeps people from entering your room from the outside, even if they have a key. So this is a really good feature, especially for places like if you're renting an Airbnb or a vacation home or something like that, and you have concerns about somebody possibly entering your room, then you can look into using a door jammer. Highly recommend that. My sixth tip is to register with the U.S. State Department. Now, this tip is specifically for people who are citizens of the United States. I know we have listeners from all over the world, and I would recommend that you see what your government has to offer because they may have something similar. For U.S. citizens, if you're traveling abroad, there is something called the STEP program. It's the Smart Traveler Enrollment Program, STEP. S-T-E-P. And all you have to do is go on to the U.S. State Department website. You enroll into this program. It's free of charge. You enter basic information about your citizenship and where you're going. And what this does is put you into a database that tells the government that one of their citizens is in this location and it registers you with the nearest U.S. Embassy. So if something happens and there's some type of natural disaster or civil unrest or some type of emergency where you are, that U.S. Embassy now knows that you're there and they will be able to actually get in contact with you to possibly give you instructions of what you should do and keep you abreast of what's going on. So this is a simple thing. It's free. It doesn't cost you any money and it really only takes just a few minutes to do this before you leave. So I highly recommend that you add this to your pre-trip activities and make sure that you make it a point to do this when you travel abroad. 
Tip number seven, purchase travel insurance. I cannot stress this enough how important this can be. This is one of those things that people typically don't do and it's not until something tragic happens that they look back with regret and wish that they had. The truth is it's really not that expensive. It's very affordable. You can get a travel insurance policy well under $100 and it's totally worth it. And it's Especially if you're going to be traveling out of the country, this is something that you absolutely want to do. There is a number usually provided for you where you would always be able to get an English speaking person to help you. And a good travel insurance company is going to coordinate whatever those needs are to address your emergency. You should also know what your personal health insurance will and will not cover. If you're traveling both domestically and abroad, there could be some restrictions that you want to be aware of and you want to understand how your travel insurance can address those gaps for you. You should also be aware when you're looking at travel insurance that there are certain activities that may or may not be covered. If you're a little bit more daring like me and you know that you like to do super adventurous things, you may have to get a policy that's a teeny bit more expensive because it will cover things a bit more dangerous than your basic policy. You should also look into what your credit card has to offer. There are many credit cards that come in that come with a built in travel insurance program. Uh, so you just want to research that and understand what they offer and what's covered and see if it makes sense to also buy something to supplement what they offer. Tip number eight, be friendly with the staff. Whether it's a hotel or a campground, I definitely recommend that you check in with the hotel's general manager if you can, or the manager on staff, or if you're at a park or a campground, then the park ranger. You want to make sure that they know who you are. They've heard your name and they've seen your face every morning before you leave. Stop and just say hi, just give a little chit chat so that they get used to seeing your face. Because trust me, if something happens and they don't see you for a while, they may take it upon themselves to check on you and notify someone if there's been an emergency. They can really have your back. Now, obviously you hear stories about places where someone on the staff was actually involved in something you know, that has happened to someone, but more than likely that's not the case. And this is also why I'm recommending someone with the position of authority and not just you know, some random Joe Schmo that you see around the property. They can also answer lots of questions for you and make recommendations for you. So just make it a point to remember their names because kindness really can go a long way and they're usually more than happy to assist you. Okay, y'all, we're in the home stretch. So tip number nine, use common sense and caution with ride share and room share services. We live in the age of Uber and Lyft and Airbnb and couch surfing, etc. These are things commonly used by travelers both domestically and abroad. And while these services are very helpful, they are much less stringent than commercial hotels or taxis when it comes to regulations. So the great thing about services like Uber and Lyft is that you have a picture and the car of your driver. You also know what their license plate is. They also come with a feature where you can share your route with friends or family. So take advantage of these built-in features. Always double check that the driver that you see in your app matches the driver that's there to pick you up. And trust your gut, trust your intuition. If it doesn't feel right, if it doesn't look right, then don't get in the car, it's really that simple. Now when it comes to booking a room through something like Airbnb or something like that, do your due diligence, read the reviews. Definitely if you can use someone who's a designated um, super user, then go for that because usually they're going to have the best reviews and they're going to have an established reputation of being a really good renter. I'm personally a fan of renting an entire space. 
um, versus a room and a place to each their own. I just like having my own space and I'm not too keen on sharing a space with a stranger. I had a wonderful Airbnb experience when I went to Sedona. It was actually a casita, which is like just a guest house on the side of the house. So it was still completely had its own entrance. You know, I had my own parking space. I only saw my host when they came to greet me and they came to see me off, but I had all the privacy in the world for my entire stay. So if you do do something where you're going to be sharing the space, you know, with the host, then, you know, having something like a door jammer might be a really good idea because that way you have that added bit of security that someone can't just walk into your room. And drum roll, please. <laughs> The 10th and final tip for traveling and staying safe, use social media smartly. I know this sounds like a no brainer, but today with it being such commonplace to snap a pic, post it on Instagram, stream live, go on Snapchat, go on Facebook Live. We have all of these mediums that give people direct access to everything that we're doing and exactly where we are right there at that moment in time. And the reality is you're leaving crumbs like Hansel and Gretel to tell people exactly where you are and how to find you. And so you just have to use a little bit of caution and a little bit of common sense. You can still share those fabulous gram-worthy pics, but maybe don't share them right away in real time. I'm personally a fan of sharing things in kind of, sort of real time. So you may see me post a really dope pic about brunch, but I probably left that location an hour to two hours before I ever post the pic. And that way, I'm not sharing where I am right at that exact moment where somebody could see that and be waiting for me. You know, as a blogger and a social media influence, it's a fine line. And a lot of times people will want me to share things real time, but I just have to be very cautious about when I do so. If I'm with a group, that's one thing. But if I'm by myself, I'm very cautious about the social imprint that I leave because I just don't want to make myself a mark target. So if I do a real time check in, it's definitely from something that's a private account that I know only friends are going to see and not this opened up to the world. So just use caution. Keep your real time sharing at a minimum. You know, turn off your location services on things like Snapchat that are going to give people an actual map to where you are. You know, just don't do that. Be smart and use some common sense. I know I've given a lot of don'ts in this episode, but I really do just want you to be able to live your very best life, but also to be safe. I want you to be strong, be courageous, and I want you to go out there and have an amazing time on your solo trip. Most of these really are common sense, but some of these might be things that you didn't know. So if you have a tip that I didn't share, please send me an email to podcast at outdoorsydiva.com. Or if you want to share with me where you're going on your next solo trip, I would love to hear all about it or about your experience. And if these tips helped you in any way, by all means, I love to know how my voice and the podcast is helping my audience. So again, you can send an email to podcast at outdoorsydiva.com. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for listening. I hope that you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, make sure you subscribe to the Outdoorsy Diva podcast. Be sure to check out Misadventures of an Outdoorsy Diva blog on OutdoorsyDiva.com. You can also keep up with me and my adventures, so check out all of my social channels. Find Outdoorsy Diva on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest.